There's the legacy, naming it after my parents, for example. It allows them to be remembered, I hope. Gives them a place in history. People will be curious about who these people are and maybe, maybe find out more about them and know more about their contributions. But also, it's not just about uh, legacy, it's also utility. I'm more and more interested in the notion of these things being a kind of seedbed for ideas, an aggregation of objects that are going to be important to people in the future. Some of these things are very fragile. Some of these things are ephemeral. Some of these things won't last, but all of them say something about our time, and that's an artist's responsibility, is to say something about their times. Coincidentally, that piece by Rauschenberg was made in, I think, 1968 or 69. Uh, I didn't get it until I, in the 1980s, but that matches up with when I graduated from Pullman High School. And to 2018 is now 50 years. So I feel sort of responsible for this is my 50 years, that I should be laying things aside and making sure they're protected and making sure they're preserved so that this portion of history is sort of guarded and available to people in the future. The objects are important. Um, the objects have lives. So it's not just um, legacy, it's not just utility. It's also a credential for the institution, I think, and it's also destiny. I think it's good to think about legacy being destiny, but it's. It's, you don't have a future unless you have a past, unless you're preserving the past, unless you can return to the past, unless you can be uh, studying it and being interested in what human beings have done for you. And that's, I think, more and more critical because it seems like we have shorter and shorter memories. That is kind of where that whole idea of collecting and uh, why I continue to do it. Where I want to go with this, we donate, Yvonne and I donate things to institutions in New York State and Washington State because they're the two states that I've actually lived in, and they are the two most important states in the world. So um, I, I am going to continue to give things to WSU, and give things to Albright Knox in Buffalo, New York, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, although they have money, they don't need me to give them things. They, uh, there are a lot of places that I tend to continue to give to institutions, and there's an intention behind these things too, because the things I want to give to WSU particularly, are the things that I think fill gaps. I think WSU's collection can use more photography. They haven't told me this, but I just think that. So I'm going to try to be giving, give them more photography. Uh, like almost every art institution in the United States and maybe around the world, it's short of women artists. Women artists are underrepresented in this collection. They need more women artists represented. They, uh, people of color need to be better represented in this collection. It needs to be a more open, deep, uh, an inclusive collection. Uh, not that it isn't good now, not that it isn't uh, ambitious now and doing wonderful things with the pieces they have, but the improvements can be made to those things that I think are gaps in the, in the collection. So that's what I intend to do. I hope that's okay with you. That's, uh, um, so. Why the Leon Gallo is hung so low, one of the pieces? Well, that's an aesthetic decision from the installation crew. So, Ryan, do you, do you want to? Yeah. No, I'm always looking for ways to create visual interest in the room. Um, and something about that work and the thought of that, the crowd and the disruption, unrest, made sense to me that it was kind of a bit lower. Down here. That's an angle. Uh, that, that was a sort of book that he published. Uh, his work is, uh, this is typical of his work, or at least a period of his work, where he's taking the geometric. Um, shapes and then running lines on them and creating the you know disruptions and conversations between the lines and the, and the shapes. They're purely abstract. There's there's not a lot of emotion to them. They're very dispassionate mathematical works. Why but, did you collect them? Sure because I thought they were beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's it's I'm, I'm I'm not deep. I'm not complicated. Uh, what I but I am greedy in the sense that. Uh, I want an artwork to do everything. I want it to be beautiful. I want it to be thoughtful. I want it to be have content, be driven by ideas. I want it to be accessible to study and interpretation and extended viewing. And so I want a lot of things. But in that case, I walked in and I saw them and I said, 
This, this, this is just flat out beautiful, I thought. I mean, thousands wouldn't, but I, 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 I only really thought it was beautiful. Um, there's a kind of rigor to that that's nice. <laughs> and a kind of discipline of somebody spending all their time making these geometric shapes and, and making, giving you an aesthetic response to them. Do you like them? I love them. Oh, good. <laughs> She's asking about the pieces by Yvonne Puffer. Yvonne is very uncomfortable that this is in the show. And I didn't dictate that be in the show. Uh, they chose it because of its quality, and I told her that. Um, she won't hear it. But, um, but, and it does look a little suspect because of my, you know, it's worked by my wife. So of course you're gonna put it up. No, it didn't work that way. This was a portfolio of things when I was publishing prints uh, and I was, uh, uh, were we married yet? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, yes. Um, but I simply loved her work and I asked her if she would experiment with making prints which she did, and she produced a number of them, and I thought, well, they, they hang together really well. They look as if they're almost telling a story. It makes a really nice portfolio. I'll publish these. And so uh, it became a project that happened to be with my wife. Um, and I think they have every right to be in this exhibition. It's interesting because um, I started seeing reproductions of that. This again, it was made in the late '60s, and it was done in a large edition. And Rauschenberg wanted to do a, a, an edition that was going to be very democratic, so it was a huge edition, and um, and it was very, very large. And he was this the first print that was ever made on a press that was meant to make billboards. So he was experimenting with new technology, and he found Marion Javits to sort of sponsor and drive this uh, project to Mary Javits was married to Senator Jacob Javits. And now in New York is the Jacob Javits Civic Center, and there are a number of things named after him. Very important politician in New York. But uh, I saw that, and in the course of uh, uh, sort of doing the research, I contacted her, and she invited me over to their apartment, and she showed me the things that she had published. There were a couple of other things that they had published in addition to this. She gave me those two. And then, um, and I met the senator at that point, the senator was in a, in a wheelchair, but uh, he, and he had retired uh, from Washington. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of, you know, there's an artist I know that says that paintings uh, are the doors to other people's homes. And in a way, that's true. This was an artwork that became a, an, uh, an opportunity to enter a realm that I would never have entered otherwise. And uh, so you meet the most interesting people when you look at prints. So that's, that's, that's kind of the story behind that. Yeah. Artists tend to go and look at those parts of the society that a lot of the other people around don't want to look at. There's, uh, there's a story about Joseph Boyce, who's one of my favorite artists, a German artist. And they, uh, a city um, wanted to commission sculptures for their festival. And they, they commissioned all these sculptures and they commissioned him. And what he did is he found this bridge where these two sort of roads came together underneath the bridge. And that's where homeless people gathered and attics shot up and it was grungy and dirty. And, and what he did is he filled that with wax and then he pulled the whole thing out. And embedded in this wax was all of this garbage and detritus of, of the dark side of the city. The city fathers hated it. But it was unquestionably a powerful work. And it made change. It helped to rectify that situation, at least at that spot. So, um, you know, I'm very interested in every time's political attention. I'm also very interested in the idea that uh, that is a function of art. It's not just to make beautiful things, it's to make things that are loaded and uncomfortable and draw attention. That's why it's, it's become very fashionable to talk about the economic importance of art, and it is economically important, and how it can influence communities, and how it can influence real estate, and all these things. 
So what I found as I've gotten older, and this is a little weird, but I keep thinking that uh, having artists around are actually uh, uh, important to the evolution of our species. And one of the things that I think makes them important is that congenital dissatisfaction with the world as it is. Okay. More, than, more than you wanted to hear. So. So. And, and anybody else? Please, I can't have answered really more questions. So my question to you is, what drew you specifically to those images that are there was not equal representation for women artists in the art world. That's true. Uh, the, the museums don't collect as many women artists. The market doesn't sell as many women artists. But what I really like about them, I, 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 I admire them for raising the issue. But what I really love about them is they do it with a kind of charm and sense of humor and a kind of really <coughs> clever strategy of getting these things on billboards and everything in ways that you wouldn't otherwise see art delivered. So, you know, and they show up at events and they all wear gorilla masks. You know, so you, theoretically, you're not supposed to know who these people are. And, um, you know, I just love the fact that I started doing art, art exhibitions and a group of women dressed as gorillas would come. I thought that was, you know, that got my attention, made me interested. You know, we talked about the issues. That was interesting. So it was, it was not only a matter of the issue, but the tactics that they used to strategic or tactically advance those issues. So that's what I particularly like about them. And you could start a folding group. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But there's a there's a there's a gorilla girl who lives in my building. And if you if you come to New York, I'll introduce you and she can help you set up a chapter. <laughs> that are from lesser known or local artists and, and if you think there is value in that kind of a collection. I, I really do because I think that one of the things that happens, an accepted canon gets formed. And so if you go to the Museum of Modern Art, it's a great museum, but if you walk into the Museum of Modern Art, it looks like a really good corporate collection because they have you know, the right names, you can sort of tick them off. It's not that these people don't deserve to be acknowledged, but you know, and then you go to Chicago, and you go to Seattle, and you go to Los Angeles, and you go to the museums, and they have the same people, works by the same artists. And again, very talented, very deserving artists. But that's not all the art that's being done. There are tremendous regional uh, uh, groups of artists very often get discovered later, you know, because they, they have energy and talent and, and are active. But, you know, I think it's really important to collect the artists that you really care about, that you really like. Uh, and I think those people are just as important in a funny way. Uh, if, if for no other reason, they contextualize what else is going on. That's one of the things about the collection. If, if this collection, if you could see everything other than it being exhausting, you would see that there are a lot of objects by artists who are not so well known, who are doing things that are interesting, that aren't part of the mainstream. Maybe they're in Seattle and not in New York, and because New York has all of the arts publications, and that's where most of the promotion happens, and that's where a lot of the money goes, and that's where a lot of the market lives. You don't get the attention paid to the people in these other cities sometimes. So I think it's really important.